I'd just like to let everybody know before we start the podcast, there may be the odd swear word during fighting on the inside. Also, some of the subjects that we cover, especially those surrounding mental health, some people may be affected by these conversations. If you are, then you can find information and help in the show notes. But please, other than that, enjoy the show. Right, guys, before we get started, I would like to say a huge thank you to our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, trust me, take it from me. If you're a boxing fan and you do not have a VPN service, I would highly recommend you get one. There's been plenty of times, so many times, where I've been wanting to watch a huge fight that is broadcast in another country but have not been able to. But if you go and sign up to NordVPN, you can digitally locate yourself within that country so you are able to watch any of those huge fights you wouldn't have been able to otherwise also for just the price of a cup of coffee per month a nordvpn account can be used on up to six devices allowing you and your family to stay digitally safe when you're out and about or using public wi-fi so nordvpn also protects you wherever you are in the world and like i said if you're a boxing fan you need one so before the podcast starts Press pause, go into the show notes, click on the link, and you can go and sign up to NordVPN. You'll get a huge discount plus a bonus gift. So, NordVPN, thanks for sponsoring the show, and welcome to Fighting on the Inside. Let's get on with it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fighting on the Inside. As always, first and foremost, a massive thank you to all of our sponsors, Well Hydrate, NordVPN, Pulse Roll and Real Power of One. Without all of those guys, we couldn't do what we're doing. And as all of you lot now know, this podcast is all in aid of Gloves Up, Knives Down, so all proceeds go to the charity. So today we are joined, myself and Johnny, by the newly crowned British champion, Heavyweight champion at that, Fabio Wardley. Fabio, I have to say, mate, I was ringside for your fight and what a scrap that was. What an atmosphere. <laughs> How do you feel? Like what's the fallout now? British champion? Yeah, I feel um I feel I feel unreal. I feel unreal. It, it feels it's such a especially that belt itself, is such a prestigious belt to hold of and and be a part of and have your name attached to in history and just being able to hold it, show it to my friends, family and stuff. It was a real sense of achievement for me. It was something I was really proud of. And I was, probably not to the the happiness of my team, but I was happy with the way the fight went as well. I wanted a bit of that. I wanted a bit of a scrap. I wanted my nose to go and a bit of blood and it to be earned. Because it's such a big bell and it has so much attached to it, I wanted it to feel earned. So... Yeah, I think I ticked most of the boxes for that one. It's quite a famous belt for for those fights, isn't it? British titles. I mean, you'd know this, mm. Johnny. It, it, it's definitely one of those things that you you get the two best in the country at the time, hungry, um, and you, you you see a great fight, and you definitely delivered on that. Um, just saying that when you say you wanted it to be a scrap, I know you wear your shorts. You got that sort of Spartan yeah, style. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that gladiatorial. Is that, gladiatorial. That's it. That was what I was looking for. Is that is that the sort of style of fighting you like to do? Then you like it to be a war. You train for a war. You're sort of up for the. Yeah, for the it's, back and it's, forth. I'm never. I'm never. I'll never shy away from one. Mm. I'll never shy away from one at all. That's that's something I, something I love. I think something as we as boxers. I think we do live for those moments, although, like I say, against how your coaches may want you to do, yep. the team behind you and stuff, may want to box clean and nice and stuff. You, I think for you, for you to survive and have some longevity in this game, you need to have that bit of you that goes, if you want to go, we can go. I don't mind. Like, I'll I'll throw down with you. And and in that situation, I came out on top. And, and yeah, it was, it was a good one. Now, if I close my eyes and you were speaking... <laughs> the last thing I thought you did was was boxing, and I, I think you were—I don't know—maybe a priest. We oh, <laughs> talk correctly, man. You don't speak I'm very not thinking. Well, well, I th I'm thinking. Where have you come from? Where, where, boxing clearly wasn't that. You, you didn't have. You couldn't have had a, a rough upbringing. What, mm. what do you do? Oh, well, the thing is, I tell you what it was. I I didn't have a. A quote-unquote rough upbringing. <laughs> He's still laughing in the voice. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm because I'm going to detail it so well. Because um, 
I didn't have a quote unquote rough upbringing. Don't get me wrong, mum wasn't the nicest, but I realised that if I could speak well, it would. I could win intellectual battles and instead of them turning into physical ones. I could outword you. I could I could tell you you're stupid in so many different ways without you having to think, okay, cool, I'm gonna just lump into you. Because <laughs> you know you know you get into them stupid altercations where it says, Oh, you this and then your mum that and then it, it basic level. Whereas I felt if I could use my words properly, not only one would I be able to get through verbal altercations a lot better, I could also get myself into better in a better place because I wasn't the best in school I wasn't the best behaved I didn't do the best things but I felt that if I could speak like I was if I went into an interview and I could talk to a certain like degree a certain level it would give me that in and I could move away from being oh yeah man whatever bruv you can fuck off no 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 and that's where it came from and I kind of I, I'm not going to say I like researched words or anything like that at all but I paid a lot of attention to how people spoke in certain places um and and how it helped them elevate themselves so what was your what was your education or your school life like you say you weren't the best in school were you a bit of a troublemaker or what was yeah the... i was i was a troublemaker i was um i lost the interest it, it wasn't for me it wasn't my i liked school because i was a social person i liked my friends i liked playing sports i liked messing around my eights and laughing and joking and whatever else but the educational side I did the minimum to get me through because I knew that I needed to at least make it through I didn't want to completely fail out and do bad but I did enough to get me through a class and then once I'd felt I'd done whatever to get through then all bets are off and I was what did you want to do when I came out of school yeah. um I wanted to be an entrepreneur of some sort I wanted to have some sort of business Not I wanted priest. to no. <laughs> <laughs> Priest, priesthood was second on the list it was high up it was high up but um i wanted to be some sort of un entrepreneur i wanted to have um i wanted to have a business i wanted to own some sort of company or do you know what it was it was weird i had this weird uh, looking back on it anyways it's weird but i had like a weird dream of i really wanted to do those businessy things i wanted to wear a suit to work every day i wanted a briefcase i wanted to have to book meetings i wanted a pa i wanted to, oh, to make deals on the phone and blah 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 and those are the things i wanted to do and funnily enough my first my first proper couple of jobs was that i was a recruitment consultant so then i did do that i wasn't an entrepreneur but i did all those things i thought i wanted and i was wearing suits and a nice three piece and i was working for a company in london and i'd go to business meetings and i'd make deals on the phone and stuff and then after in total i did it for about five or six years but it got tedious and i realized that wasn't actually i liked the image of what i thought that was for me and how it looked but the actuality of it and and the day-to-day -day of it wasn't for me if if you if you didn't okay so that's <clears throat> that's probably the vision you had so as a youngster what were your what was your circle of, what was your circle like what was your circle of friends like what was the what were the temptations hmm. <coughs> for you growing up laughing <laughs> <laughs> at that word it depends, oh, okay, it depends how much i can say really um, <laughs> open book on this podcast, no mate. um i was i was surrounded by criminals drug dealers robbers a lot like i but I was all, weirdly I was the social butterfly that I could do both I could go and spend the evening with them lot and because they were my boys they were who I grew up with I was never going to change I was never going to judge them they picked their path and whatever it was and and they went down whatever road they went down but they were still my boys they were still the boys I grew up with so I still would do all the same things with them chill with them be around them they'd drink smoke weed whatever those things weren't for me I, would, I I was a drinker I would always drink and party and I got into a few other extracurricular activities that eventually over time I would phase out of but I could I kept a bit of a balancing act for a while at least of being in an office being a quote-unquote corporate in some sense and then still being able to go sit in my mate's house and four, five, six of us, they're all rooms puffed to smoke and people are drinking and doing blah, 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 whatever else. But I could do both. I didn't see, I didn't feel like at that moment in time anyways, I had to separate myself. Do you feel like when you say you're a social butterfly, more of a social chameleon in the sense that you can fit into certain environments quite comfortably? 
um, yourself. You know, you could. You, I find a lot of people can can do this. Some people can can go and be friends with these people and go and be friends with them people. You're obviously a very likable person, but you found that you could turn into yeah. Each tho- I each could those fit. I could, could fit whichever fit. scenario. I guess I had m- multiple facets of myself, which I could fit into whichever areas felt was needed. But I never felt like I was anyone. I was not, it never felt forced or yeah, changed. Yeah, no, yeah, it course. was just me having multiple sides of me of, I am that person. I do come from that place. And I did live that life for a little bit with those people. But then there was a point of me that went, we need to, this, there, there's a... What made you make that choice of the path you ended up going down? <clears throat> it was a split between I want it was a split between a multiple of things it was a split, a split between self ambition of that I wanted to be someone I didn't like I'd seen for years and years of the people I'm be around and they like again if you want to go back to it like drug dealers and they would have the money and the cars and everything but it would be finite they'd have it for a short period of time and they weren't they were someone for a short period of time but that was it and then they, but they you, went. you usually find that crab in a bucket effect mm. as you're a youngster growing up. So when you start to leave your boys behind, being successful in whatever field that is, your boys will make you feel guilty for stepping mm. up or they'll, you'll, they'll make you feel uncomfortable or, and they're trying to drag you back down with them. Was, did that not happen to you? Did, 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 was that not the case? No, funnily enough for me, they were actually all really supportive. They were like, because I think there was an understanding between a lot of them that this is this is our life, yeah. Okay, we know where we are and kind of where we're where we're stuck at. But if you can do it, then go do it. Like we, we are your boys still your boys? Yeah, are still the same people. Still the same people, regardless what they do, who they hang around with, whatever. They're still my people. Like it doesn't matter. They still all come to my fights. They still mm. all. They still all support me. They still buy tickets. They do all the same things. So, so it can be done. It can be. Cause I know I find it very hard to 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 keep that same bunch of friends I had from being <coughs> young mm. uh, to it, till it got to a point where all of my friends are from the gym. All of my friends are to do with boxing. We think boxing. Yeah. At boxing, spoke boxing. That was that was my circle, and that's my friends now as the as an adult so but but it can be done it can be done I, again going back to what james said being a social chameleon that i've built different friend groups for different scenarios so when i'm when i'm done with camp or whatever and i want to go live a bit of a more free lifestyle my boys are there and they they are they're understanding in the sense that boys it's camp time now you're not going to see me too much we will see you catch up and do whatever but Obviously, you lot are going out, you're doing this, you're going here and there. That's not going to fit with where I am, what I'm doing right now. That's where then I more dip into my gym friends, where we're going gym every day, we're eating healthy, we're going here, we're doing that, blah, blah, blah. Or I can go just retreat into my family and same thing as well, same group, people that would just be supportive of whatever current situation. Because I feel like my life works in bursts. Like I'm in camp, that's a dedicated singular vortex thing where nothing else bothers me in there that's where i have to be 1000 percent. and then once i'm out i can live a bit more free i can do a few more other things and i can open up but i can always just go straight back to it and no one i'm i guess i'm really lucky and really fortunate that no one ever judges me or no one ever goes where the fuck have you been for the past few months like my lot understand that hey i'm trying to do something here and they're like, no, 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 we see that and we're proud of you for it. So, I mean, that's a sign of true friendship. I've always said it's those mates that you can go away for two, three years. I moved away when I was quite young and it's those mates that doesn't matter how long you don't see them for. Mm. There's no judgment, there's no animosity. You go back and it's like you never left. Yeah, um, exactly. So I guess you've got groups of people that are like that because you've got strong bonds there. Um, so just to touch on then, in terms of sort of your childhood, your upbringing, you grew up around like you said, so certain sort of characters, some people not doing the right things here and there. Um, what was in your sort of circles growing up? What, what did it mean to be tough as a youngster? Like, what did, <laughs> what did you see that as then and why? Like, what was your relationship with that word? For me, being tough was just in, 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 any, in any situation, backing up your word and then not backing down. So if you said you was gonna do something, that was always my thing. 
I never, I'll be honest, growing up, I never got, I never got into too many fights. I never needed to. I think because again, growing up, I was quite large. I was surrounded by quote unquote, relatively dangerous people. Wasn't, didn't need to be in those situations. I wasn't individually challenged too many times, but my thing was at least, if I say I'm gonna do something, it will, I will do it regardless Many if I words. said it in the heat of the moment or if I said something nasty or if I said something that's a bad outcome you knew me as he will go do that if I say I'm gonna come find you I will come find you like that's that was where I, that was what I sat myself on is that for you a bit of a defense mechanism then because as soon as you got known for saying that and then carrying it out that was that was your way of staying out of trouble was to make sure the people knew you'd stick to your word yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there was Again, minimal times where I had to enforce it or whatever, but mm. I was known that if Fab says he's going to come to your house and find you, he will come to your house and find you. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on, what's, who's around you, whatever, he, he will do those things. And there was, again, minimal times where I needed to do them, but I, I did them in in enough situations, certain, like in a certain time that it was, okay, cool, we don't need this. There's no need to have that problem. You find, I mean, that's quite like speaking to someone like yourself. It's quite, um, I wouldn't say extreme, but it's a, t it's a tough thing to say. It's quite a hard nosed thing to say. Do you find that you, your environment made you need to be that tough? Did you, did you get into a lot of, is there any examples of the sort of stuff you used to be faced with that made you have to, to be that person? Do you know what I mean? To, to, it was more so, again, like I say, the selective people I was around. Like they, so they were the ones. I was. I, I never felt. Then I never. I was. I never had the bravado to want to be the loud one, the mm. one to pop out of the front of the group and go, "Come on, then let's go. We're gonna have it out." But I was with those that would, mm. and they were my people. So I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Whatever goes on, I'm. I'm right there next to you. But if it needed to come to that, it needed to come to that. But that's where probably it came from. Mostly for me was, I am. Um, I, I pride myself on being there for my people and my friends in whatever, whenever situation they may need me. Hi guys, quick shout out to our sponsor Pulse Roll. Did you guys know that Pulse Roll are on a mission to get people moving? And over the past six years, they have built the UK's leading percussion massage therapy gun used by people such as Anthony Joshua. And Pulse Roll have created a current range of six devices scientifically proven to enhance recovery and rehabilitation. To find out why their range is so good and what makes it so good, visit pulseroll.com where you can find educational content and blogs to help you perform smarter, recover faster, and keep moving. So that's pulseroll.com. Pulseroll.com to help you keep moving. And thanks to Pulse Roll for sponsoring this show. Uh, I suppose now, especially with you getting more notoriety in, the, in your success in the ring, that mindset had to change, has to change, <clears throat> or, or has changed. Mm. It's, I needed to pull, again, pull myself away. I, can't, I just can't be in them situations anymore. I can't be next to them when it goes off. I need to understand. It's funny because I, I, I'm weirdly self-aware of like the environments I'm in, the places I'm in now. I'm, I'm looking left to right more. Is there about a situation? You're no longer to... discreet. No, uh, yeah. no, that's the thing. I'm not undercover. People know me, so I'm known. So if something goes off, I'm easy to pick. And this is something I have to be self-aware of because now it's not just me that m myself or my career is based around. It's my coach, it's my friends, it's my family. There's a lot more of an attachment to, oh, if Abby Awardley gets in this situation, it affects so many other people as opposed to when I was a kid. It was just whatever. And talking to the next fighter, when you came into the game, the way you actually fell into boxing, this boxing wasn't your first love as a youngster. Boxing was something you thought, I'll have a go. Mm. As, as an adult. And, and so I suppose you were probably fine with a bit, of chip, a bit of a chip on your shoulder in the professional ranks to start off with because of the, the path you came through in boxes. Tell us about it. Yeah, massively, because <laughs> I even, um, I remember my so you when you go to get your professional license i remember you got you've got to go to the board and have a meeting mm. and they ask you about yourself and they ask you about your background and where you come from and i was sat there with i don't know three four five six other boxes and stuff and they go around the room and this guy's aba this and this guy's aba that and that guy's aba champion here and they get to fabio wardley and i go 
yeah, I'm white collar. I've had four fights. <laughs> <laughs> and the look of like, oh, <laughs> disgust, I guess, of like, yeah. and you, you think you have the audacity to come here and think you can turn pro. And, and, I, would, and I had to kind of sit through and firm that and take that on the chin and be like, okay, I'll prove you. Don't worry. Just wait out, wait out, wait out. I've, I've, I've always had a canny ability that to turn the blinders on and just be like, I can sit. I I don't mind winning in the long run. I don't mind sitting through the Take your battles. Yeah, I don't mind sitting through the the bad looks. Uh, but I know, a year, two years, whatever, I'll win eventually. I know I'll get there. It's just I don't mind sitting through it. So it's funny being in those situations where they're looking at me like, "What are you? What are you even doing here? Why do you even think you're where, worth being here?" Where's the confidence and self belief come from for you? My family, I think. My family, my mum, my stepdad or dad. Um, because no matter what I did in life, they always believed in me. I could I could have said I want to be an astronaut and my mum would be like, yeah, cool, no worries. I bet you can. Uh, the same as my old man. He'd be like, of course you can, boy. You can do whatever you want to do. And same thing. I remember when I, um, I left high school, I went to sixth form for a little bit. And I remember I, after a month, I was like, fuck this, I left. And I, got, I literally left in the middle of the day and I came home. I told my mum and I went, um, look, mum, sorry, this is not for me. I've, I've quit out. And she went, all right. She didn't what? bat an eye. Wow. But she went, she, all she said to me was, all right, no problem. But don't think you're doing nothing. You can go get a job. You can go find something else. You can go get another avenue. But if that's not for you, that's fine. But you're not doing nothing. That was always instilled in me is that we work. As a family, we work, we... We, we graft towards what we need to do. And you had both parents with you. Are you one of the fortunate few to go with both parents in your life? In a, yeah, in a slight abstract way. So um, my dad left when I was, my biological dad left when I was two, two plus. Um, so it was just me and my mum for a, a number of years. And then my mum met my stepdad when I was about seven, something like that. Um, and they've been together ever since. So for all intents and purposes, that's my dad, that's, that's my guy, that's my everything. Same with my mum. Um, he's <laughs> the guy's been in my been in my life for twenty years. He's been through everything that he could go through as a dad. The one thing that rings out when we're doing these is is, is parenting, parenting mm. of how we educate our kids growing up. How, the, the 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 path we set out for them or the example we lay for them can usually. Uh, result in the outcome of the the, the youngster or how that youngster is or isn't mm. life, even know? regardless of their environment because it really it seems that people in the worst environment surrounded by the worst people are really well raised can 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 sort of have more upper, more chance to come through that unscathed or at least mm. make the right choices um would you say you had you had that support you had that good yeah above above everything don't get me wrong every parent every family whatever has flaws they have yeah, their yeah, their issues and stuff and as again, being part of that family, I was around some things that a child shouldn't be subjected to, but they did, I always believe they did a great job in parenting me because I was a difficult child as well. I was always very, <laughs> like I said, I could always speak. I could I, I could always get my <laughs> point across. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, mouth, <laughs> I I was a mouthy, I, I was it. a smart ass. Yeah. I needed someone to, to go back at me and my mum, was a bit, my mum's not a soft person, but verbally, even as a youngster, she couldn't really compete with me. Whereas my stepdad could, he was very smart, intellectual, again, very big man as well, like six foot five. And what, what was it, was it respect for him you had? Was it, his, was it the, the way he taught you, the way he spoke to you? What was it? It was a developed respect over time. We had a rocky start at the beginning because, understandable, because I was, I came from a dad that left me. So I had a resentment. I had just had my mum, so that was that was my only person. And then this man comes in and tries to start disciplining me and teaching me and telling me how to act and how to behave. And I had a fat chip on my shoulder towards that. I was like, and also I was going through a bit of a some somewhat of I don't know if you, the right word is an identity crisis. But my mum's white and now my stepdad's white, and I'm from Ipswich, which is a predominantly oh, white so. area. Mm. So I'm surrounded by white people and I have no connection to my own culture really. I have, mm. I have a few black friends and whatever and 
But they're in similar situations. Their dad's funnily nephew as well and whatever else. So it's quite, it was quite um, a funny situation for me to try and navigate again. I think and that partly not foreign, not foreign by the way, because a lot of there's a lot of youngsters in that mm. position uh, of 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 not having an identity in regards to even in their own home or where they are or in their or in their uh, social environment. Mm. But yeah, carry on. Um, but I was going to say that's where I feel like the the speech thing, being able to speak so well, came from. I felt right. Okay, if I can at least fit in verbally with these people. I'll be somewhat accepted. I'll be I'll be able to fit in. I'll be able to, I'll feel more attached to this around me. Not not me and my family, mm. but just the general wider public of white people surrounded by me. They they spoke a bit different. They were a bit more polite and whatever else. Um. So I think partly that's where that came from as well. Was looking to again dip more into being that social chameleon of okay I can fit over here. Okay I can fit over here. I can do bits and bobs. And that's why again. A lot of my boys' boys, the ones that were in trouble, they were young black men. So that's why I clung to them as well, because oh, that's a bit of me. They're my people, that's my culture, that's my friends. They're, I can look at you and you look like me kind of thing. And as a young person, um, I can remember that being a bit of a funny one for my brain to kind of figure out. Mm, that's understandable. I suppose it'd get you angry as well, because again, you just feel lost, you feel... Uh... And so you need that someone or some something to 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 grab hold of to 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 lead you in the right path. Did you, so so when you went to the started boxing, mm. when you actually got into boxing, was it just something a, a release? You know, you did white collar. Was it a release? Why was it? Again, it was a self ambition thing. I felt I wanted to be someone. I wanted to do something, and I've always enjoyed self like testing myself and seeing how far I can push myself and seeing what I can do to myself, not in, along the lines of yeah, self-harm yeah. or anything yeah. like that. But boxing such a 1v1 thing of how long can I pump away on that bag for or how many push-ups can I get through or can I do that extra mile on the run? And I, I thrive off those individual in my brain arguing with myself you. moments yeah. going, Fab, you're not going to fucking do this run, are you? you, you you're not going to do it. And I'm going, I am, I'll get there. You go, nah, mate. Like, just sack it off. You've done half of it. Do the rest. So, you tell, feel me, like, yeah, tell, you tell had... me your reasoning why why you decided to to do your first white collar fight. What was it? Yeah, um, why 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 was it boxing? Why was it a fight? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it was boxing. I don't know. I, well, again, the reason I feel it was boxing itself was because I um I enjoyed the one v one, and another part of the reason I got into boxing was I played football at a relatively decent level as a young lad, but I hurt both my ankles quite badly. Mm. So I couldn't play anymore. Um, so I was missing that competition element in me. I had nothing to go for. Um, and as a young lad coming up and in school and stuff, I was part of a, a program called Positive Futures. So it was a program to help, um, not underprivileged, but kids that will get themselves in trouble. Yeah. Kids getting themselves in bad situations, trying to pull them away from it trying to keep them occupied with programs, mentoring, et cetera. Um, and in that was where I met my coach, currently coach, Rob Hodgins. Um, same coach. Same coach. Then. Wow. Brilliant. So yeah, he's known me since I was uh, like 10, maybe 11, something oh, like that. Wow. Um, so we do other things. We do football, we do a little bit of boxing and just mm. stuff. But in those programs to keep you, that program was designed to keep naughty kids away from naughty situations and pull you off the streets and blah 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 um i got older developed got a job matured pulled myself my pulled myself away from those situations um and i remember when boxing ended but i always remember that whenever i was in those programs he would always talk to me about boxing i wasn't particularly interested back then um so when when i had my football injuries and I couldn't do it anymore. I was missing that competitive element. And I just called him one day and I just said, look, can, I know you always banged on about boxing. I said, can I come up to the gym? Where are you? Can I give it a go? And he said, yeah, of course. Like, come up, train, come get stuck in. And- um, Were you that tall? Uh, I was, yeah, I was this- A coach's dream. I, yeah, but I was a <laughs> bean pole. I was, awesome. I was nothing. I was, yeah. well, I was like 14 and a half, maybe even 15 stone, like something like that. Like I was skinny, skinny. Um, for my height anyways. And um, 
uh, I remember going in and boxing and absolutely loving it. And then I remember, I said, again, me, arrogance, self-ambition. I looked around the room and I said, I said, I said to him, I was like, can I spar? He was like, it's your first, first day. He was like, first, he was like, it's your first day. I don't think you should. And I was like, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Don't worry. I'll be all right. I just want to like, you know, I just want to see what it feels like. I want to move around. And he was like, he was like, okay, okay, okay. Who do you want to spar? And then again, me pick being the me, biggest I one. picked the biggest guy. Aye. I picked the biggest guy. I looked around. I went, oh, I'll spar him. He'll be all right. <laughs> and he was, again, nice enough to spar me, but he was an ex ABA champion. Um, like I'd gone far and he ripped me to shreds. He ripped me to the body about six times. I think I took about six knees. Yeah. Like, I went down, went down, got up, went down, got up, kept going. I think I did like three rounds. <laughs> Got it out. felt like a lot longer, didn't it? <laughs> I, felt, I felt like a lifetime. <laughs> how, how old was you at this stage? Uh, I was, when I first walked into the gym ever, I was 20. Oh, all right. 20 years old. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Wow. All right. So, um, yeah, so I did that, got battered, got punched from pillar to post. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Like, I love the, because I, I have, again, weird. I have this thing where, like, if you beat me at something, I'm like, Again, longevity, I think I'll get you. It might not be next week. It might not be a month, two months, whatever. But I will, I'll commit myself and I will get better than you and I'll catch you up. And that was, I think that's what, again, me being such a late bloomer in boxing, I think that's that bit of me in my brain is what helped me do so well for so long and, and get me so far. Hello, everyone. So for those of you that may have noticed how good myself and Johnny have been looking throughout this podcast, that's because we are donning real. Now, they produce high performance sportswear inspired by boxers. Boxing is as much mental as it is physical. And real believe that it's a combination of physical and mental strength. That is where your performance potential lies. Unify body and mind to realize the power of one. Real fights for enhanced mental well-being. So whether you're a seasoned boxer or new to the sport, Real will empower you to test your limits. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram at Real Power of One, and you can find their store and their newsletter over on realpowerofone.com. And take it from me, this genuinely is some of the most comfortable and high-quality sportswear that I have ever worn. So it's realpowerofone.com for sportswear inspired by boxers. And thank you so much to Real for sponsoring this podcast. That 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 must be a sweet feeling, especially for the guy that first beat you up. Mm. Because now we're looking at this point now, and you can really be thinking: Has he boxed on? Did he pack in? He stopped after a while. So he now stopped. his problem's in a be. I battered that kid. Mm. I, I beat him. Look look how well he's British champion now. And and that that then makes people realise. You know, if I'd have just stuck at it, and 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 I suppose it's it's, it's stability mm. to think, right, well, I want to do more. But there was loads of those people. There was loads of those people that when I was coming up and sparring and stuff, that they would punch me around. And then it would be funny because I would, I always had, I like, I always say that I, I fell in love. I I went to the gym one day and I never left. That was it. I was back the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, and I just wouldn't stop. And some people would drop off and they'd come back and then they'd come back and spar me again and now I'd fuck you up yeah. and I'd be like ha ha here we go like, <laughs> and that was but that was the little bit of just the small bit of like victory. self yeah the small, the victory. small yeah. victory of okay I did I did I trained I did everything I was supposed to do I trained I stayed focused I switched on I paid attention and we've gone again and I've got better and those were the, the, those little wins every time I did it were the ones that again just made me fall deeper and deeper in love with the sport it's funny because you say you had a lot of self ambition or I think you said ego um, or arrogance whatever you said there all three there's, there's, there's something massively humble about what you're saying as well because to be able to get in there and enjoy getting beaten at something because you know you're going to go and train and get better and use that as ambition for the future there's that, I'd say that's being incredibly humble as well being able to accept that a loss now doesn't mean a loss and it means that you can use that as a mm. lesson to go and would you agree? I, I would, think I'd you, massively sound, you agree. seem like a very humble person in person <laughs> as much as you talk about yourself as if you know you'd say you're arrogant or whatever you say I wouldn't say that at all I think he's got a very you give off a very humble vibe and I think what you've just said there you know is yeah you, I would I'd agree with with that 
Um, I do. I think my ego is in me. It's not something you I want. Use it when you I need it. I don't push you? it out on people, yeah. and I don't. I'd never. I've never felt the need to be the big bravado, ego, loud guy in the room. I've all just wanted to be cool, friendly, nice. I, I think that's called. I think it's self belief. Self belief, what, exactly. Mm. Yeah, Unfortunately, I, guess that's I suppose combo. in this country, we feel very uncomfortable appreciating our special, what we're good at, whatever it is, uh, or talking about what we can do. But if you can say it as a matter of fact, well, actually, yeah, I can do that. You know, it's, 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 it, and that's what he's doing. He's actually yeah, yeah. saying, well, yeah, I can do that. It's not, I'm not bragging or boasting. I'm just going to tell you what I can do. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that, exactly. that's, that's, that's a good, it's a good trait to have, really good mm. trait to have, especially when you're going into a fight, that is as well. So, what, what's your ambitions in regards to, to boxing? Because first you're going in to prove something to yourself. Now you become a British champion. Was mm. that was that an ambition? Was my, that my ambitions changed along the way because it was funny because I I never like I never especially when I first started I never envisioned being here at, at this point of level. I all I just thought like because I started on small hall so like the small hall scene selling tickets and whatever fighting at like York Hall and other little small venues and like Norwich and things like that. Um. And those were my big nights, but I would obviously watch the TV and I'd see that people are at the O2 and Wembley and here and there. And I just thought, oh, imagine if I could get there one day, just one. Imagine like 25 fights in, end of my career, my last big one, whatever. I just, I, got, I maybe get a, a shot of something. I get one big go at the O2 and just that, that was when I first started, that was my thing. I just wanted to do that. I remember speaking to like someone who, a boxer who didn't do massives, but I remember he said he boxed at the O2, and I remember being like, oh, like this guy must be mental. Like I can't believe it. And then, obviously, my life took a bit of a whirlwind when I signed with Dylan, um, and he started to put me on big shows and things like that. And then, it's funny how your life changes because now the O2s is the venue I've boxed at the most. How did that how yeah, did you come, up, come across path, cross paths? So it um it came at we I was a sparring partner for again Dil for Dylan White for Dylan White yeah, yeah. um oh. I was um I was working a job so I'd quit my I had a full time job working in an office I'd realised that basically I took the I did I did the jump I took the leap I thought you know what I can't do both I can't work a 40, 45 hour plus job in London get home do enough time to train and everything so I quit that. I worked part time in a gym, um, and just kind of chased chased the quote unquote dream. Um, so at this point, my decision was that I take any and every option that comes towards me, no matter what. So I knew that I'd started ten, fifteen, twenty paces behind all these other people because I'd started so late. So I decided that the way to catch these people up was sparring. So I would take any any option anyone would get me. I would spar. Sam Sexton, Derek Chisora, Dylan White, anyone who would have me could have me. Whenever they needed me, I was there. I'd figure any sort of way to get there. I'd have a, I'd get a call at nine at night and I was supposed to have a shift at nine in the morning and I'd be calling around trying to swap. Boys, can someone swap for me? Someone do me a favor. I need to go do this. Swap, swap, swap. And I'd do anything I could to to just make up that time because I, I believed I needed it. Um, and that's where I built a bit of a reputation of being a go-to guy. Because I, I'd I'd not only get to the spars, I'd give the spars my all as well. I'd get stuck into him, and I think Dill recognised that in me that he could always rely on me. Like he was one of the people that would call me and be like, "Fab, I need you tomorrow. I've had someone drop out," um, and I'd be like, oh, "Shit, I've got a shift." But um, I said, "Look, give me half an hour. Let me try and move it." Blah blah blah. And then I'd call him back and I'd sort it, and I'd be up there and I'd spar and I'd be around him and spend time with him, and he'd um. The thing to me with Dill, which no one notices or no one sees, that he was, for me at least, caring before there was ever a need to. Like he understood a bit where I came from in terms of white, like um, not white collar, but small hall boxing, trying to graft your way through, make a way through. Um, and at that point, when I was doing those small hall shows, I had a dodgy manager who wasn't the best, wasn't the most helpful. Um, put me through the ringer in a few weird situations and things like that, cancelled fights, cancelled shows, just getting generally messed around. Um, and But Dill would always check in. He'd be like, oh, I thought you were supposed to fight at the weekend. Like, what happened? Why haven't you? And I'd, I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, I got cancelled again and this and that. And he'd be, like, he'd be like, shit, man, you need to 
like you need to get yourself out and sort something out and i was like yeah i know but i'm locked in like is what it is um time goes on we spend more and more time together he uses me as a sparring partner more and more and more um and then i finally get fed up of um like being in this situation where i had about a year's worth of time where i wasn't fighting i was training i was fit i was ready but shows were getting cancelled and things and i was just getting annoyed so um i managed to get myself out of um out of my contract i had to do some things but i, I managed to get myself out um and then i because by this time it'd been about a year or so year and a half maybe two but me and me and Dilla built up a real good relationship um and i just called him because i valued his honesty as a person and his experience in boxing he'd, he'd been around the block a few yeah. times he'd been in a, shit, a few shit situations himself um so i called him and i said um look i've, I've managed to get myself out of this contract i obviously want to carry on i want to keep boxing on I, I love what i'm doing but i don't want to get messed around anymore i just want to box i just want to fight like do you can you recommend me some good people like do you know who's good like who's safe secure who i can go with and when i will actually progress me properly um and we had maybe like a 10 minute or so converse conversation we spoke about a few different managers and things um and then him being him he just goes actually hang on and then hold, hangs up the phone to me without saying anything so i'm sat confused for a second i'm like what and then calls me back about five ten minutes later and goes he goes you know what forget all that S sign with me i'll take you under my wing i'll look after you we'll do all this properly and I'll make sure you're looked after and I'll give you the opportunities basically. Wow. Um, Flattery. Uh, yeah. And that was, that was the, and it was almost like the rest is history. Like that was it. I just, I remember about a week later, he was training up in Loughborough. I went up to Loughborough. We had the meeting with him and his team, signed the contract. And then I remember that's when everything went like the roller coaster just took off. Like it just went nuts. I remember Sweet. like going from small hall to then, he called he called well uh, on the drive home because at that time he was with sky so he he um i got a call from sky sports within about 20 minutes of leaving that meeting and i was like oh scott sky's calling me oh my god like oh like, <laughs> I, I, I remember like because i wasn't used to these things i was losing i was like oh my god okay. i was like i was in the car my team was, I was like everyone shut up everyone shut up no one talk no one talk and then i was like doing like some interview with sky saying oh dylan white's new protege blah 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 um and then i remember him calling me again like two or three days later saying how fit are you are you ready and i was like i'm ready to go and he was like okay cool i'll put you on um the card with me white chisora two in three weeks you're, wow. you're, you're at the o2 and i was like you're oh, on okay all right at yeah, the o2 straight away yeah i was at the, my <laughs> first ever thing was at the o2 i was like oh, yeah cool no worries easy yeah i'll do it fine like but again just like my always again with this thing my motto was say yes and figure it out learn to swim basically jump in the water learn to swim say yes and just act like you've been here before and like you were meant to be here and then eventually it will come so it's when like i went to these in you again, isn't it? yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> just uh, fit in the situation fit in the situation yeah, exactly. no matter what's going on like because i remember um first doing like press conferences and things like that and i'm <laughs> it's funny like they're still on my instagram you can like look back at them but you see that i'm sat obviously waiting to, for my turn to speak or whatever like ed, ed will say oh so and so from the talking whatever he'll say their name and then um every time for the first like three or four times every time he'd say my name i'd like giggle i'd get giddy <laughs> because I, it's fucking it's childish and i look like an idiot and like i'd sit there and he'd be like oh so and so to the left of me is uh, done well and then and fabio wardley and i'd be like <laughs> me haha like, I'm, I'm fabio wardley like what am i doing here like <laughs> I'd get in those giddy situations, but I'd have to like hold it and then be like, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity and uh, yeah, but it's great to be here. And then I'd have to like push it down. But ultimately in me, I was like, oh, the, like well, how am I here? Like, what have I, how have I made it here? And I've gone through a few of those surreal situations and obviously a lot more now, those moments are a lot more normal to me and stuff, but I'm still a, like, I'm still a kid in them situations. So I always you, say that I went from being on one side of the TV to the other. Yeah, you see, at one bit, everybody needs a mentor in one shape, form, one or another. And I think yours was, that was, it's probably Dill. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and because it's not just about learning to fight, it's about learning to conduct yourself, learning to deal with the good and the bad and the ugly uh, in this game. And I'm quite sure you've seen it, heard it, 
you know, being involved in it. But yeah. but again, it's just having that focus to think, right, this is my job. I'm here now. And and you're a British champion. Mm. Yeah. And I've so, and managed you, to wing it quite far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so my you thinking used to be upside down. So when I'd win, when I won something, I didn't think I was good. I just thought they were bad. Yeah. What's your thinking? Half so and you're half. British, you're British champion now. So officially, you're the best British fighter at heavyweight outside uh, in, within within the British Isles, obviously mm. outside the, 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 the world. The world, yeah. <laughs> do you like, believe that? Uh, I do, yeah. Good. I do, Good yeah. Answer. But it also feels like a bubble that could burst at any moment. I also, it, there's, uh, it's also a slight feeling of imposter syndrome oh, of I shouldn't be here. Like I come from, I started. I put on a pair of gloves seven years ago or coming up to eight. First ever put on a pair of gloves like, seven, you're seven, like. seven years ago. <laughs> and I'm like, I shouldn't really be here. Like, like again, my fight that I just had, I beat Nathan Gorman. He was, the guy's been boxing since he was a toddler. He's a traveler. He comes from a fighting family. He's been fighting for as long as like he could breathe almost. He, he was in the GB squad. He's had some great fights and whatever else. And then I beat him and I'm like, that's not how that's supposed to go like that's not that's not the rule but that's not the script so you kind of are thinking upside down so eventually you to, to to really own who you are you're gonna think i belong here yeah 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 there's a don't get me wrong it's a split there's a part of me but i think i enjoy the the, the slight fear of the bubble could burst because without that, it could be, as soon as the point is like, oh, I belong here. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, you I'm let your guard down then. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like maybe I settle into it too much. Whereas with, I still have that little bit of fear of, I shouldn't be here. I need to do more than that next guy. I need to do twice as much as the next person. That's what has got me here. So I feel like I need to hold on to that regardless of, regardless of the achievements I make. How do you deal with, because I know, I read an article where you'd said uh, you'd thank Dillian for the position you were in, obviously, and that was a big turning point. But you proved that you're not a white collar boxer anymore. Mm. Now, obviously, a lot of what you just said there's it's funny because uh, people on social media are wankers. We've definitely got to the uh, and you all know who you are, like these, these trolls <laughs> and all that. Because let's face it, we 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 keep getting around to that. Like this is a big thing these days. But you get a lot of stick for being a white collar boxer, and a lot of, uh, that's a big big criticism. But what you've just said there is kind of like. You say you're going to prove it to them, but you're almost trying to prove it to yourself a bit because you said that mm. imposter syndrome. You did, in a way, in your head, almost have a part of you that goes, maybe I'm like not supposed to be here yeah, kind yeah. of thing. But you, while you're proving this to them, most importantly, you're proving this to yourself. And now, have you proved it to yourself? Is yeah, that... it's a two-parter. And, yeah. and I have, and I have. And I've had, I again, I refused, I refused myself a lot of those self praise moments mm. because I don't I don't want to get lost in them I don't I don't like the comfort of them mm. I don't like the oh look at me I'm I'm doing well but I've had I had a I had a small moment where I like had I was on my own and I had the belt in the case and I just looked at the belt and I just thought yeah you've done all right here like, <laughs> give yourself doing, a belt yeah it was like <laughs> it lasted about three and a half seconds where I just went <laughs> Yeah, Fab, actually, you're not doing too bad, mate. You're doing all right. You're, you're getting there. You're and that's, getting that's, there. Actually, that's actually, you're doing it the traditional way. Mm. You pick up the British mm. and you walk on to look at the Commonwealth, pick up the European. And then eventually, once you get past that stage, you know, those times of doubt to think, God, I should I be, he be here? The collection of the success of what you're going along is is that, that is surety to think, well, yeah, mm. I've done it all. Why not? I've, pr I've proved it. That I belong here because I've done it the traditional way. This isn't luck. This isn't a springboard. Yeah, they'll open the door for me to give me the opportunity to. Because I I like how Dylan works actually. Because Dylan he'll throw you in. So get yourself in mm. there. You know, there's no pity party. No, no, no. If you no. mess up, you say, "Oh, it's your fault." I'll give you the opportunity. So I, and I like how he works with a lot of his fights. So what he's done with you is is spot on. But how you're you're going through it there, eventually you'll be able to accept how good you are mm. without feeling like you're getting complacent. Yeah, I'm chipping away at it. I'm chipping away at it. A fight by fight, achievement by achievement, it's, it's, it's come like that, that not wall or whatever, but that bit is, 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 is come, coming down and crumbling and it's yeah. becoming more of, no, I am actually meant to be here. I am meant to, but I do, again, I feel like 
that it gives i need that little bit of self-doubt to give me the edge yes. to push mm. myself in other areas to make sure i train hard enough to make sure i do the sparring to make sure i do the runs to make sure i commit stay to hungry. the yeah stay hungry yeah, yeah of course that's what I, that's where i think um for me that's why i need to hold on to it have you to touch on something you said earlier do you feel like at this stage in your life when you said that you feel you lacked identity or you were struggling on that front do you think boxing's helped Fabio Wardley become somebody that you know get help give you an identity give you that yeah massively that, mm. because again like I said earlier on I, I always had a I always had an ambition I wanted to be somebody and now you're the I British am. champion I am someone now <laughs> I am <laughs> someone but not just mm. not just in boxing outside yeah, yeah. of boxing as yeah. well like I'm extremely well known in Ipswich in my hometown for a variety of reasons now because of Yes, because of boxing, but because I've got a heavy attachment to the football club as well. Yeah, yeah. And they, um, we have a great relationship and I was there, the poster boy for them, for their kit launch and my face is like plastered around the club and there's a, little, a few like little milestones through my... Um, there's a responsibility with success and that's the responsibility yeah. because mm. now your responsibility of being a, the, 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 the face of certain things and being a bit of a name... Uh, where you are sometimes when I talk in schools and kids say I want to be famous I say you know what fame is mm. it's an open prison mm. yeah, 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 because you can no longer do the things that you want yeah. to do and what your mates are doing so that, that's the responsibility of where you're at yeah yeah massively massively and I notice it in, in funny day to day things that I can't do some of the little things that I would go do or I can't act a certain way in public I, I would if I wasn't me like I, it's not on a massive scale don't get me wrong I'm not the rock or I'm not like Obama or whatever like I'm still just from Ipswich but there's still small attachments of oh I saw Fab so like, relative mate. doing this and doing that and, and, and you and like believe it or not you're probably inspiring some young men coming through mm -hmm. and I don't mean just a kid you're probably thinking some guys thinking I know that guy I used to see him knocking about look what he's done now mm. so 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 that that that's part of the responsibility of of what you're doing and how you conduct yourself. Yeah, massively. Like I I I do get people that say to me like, "Ah, oh, Fab, like you not you inspire me, but I look up to you, and it's great what you're doing." And people are really praised. So I actually one the other day, like I do get messages um, from people, younger kids and lads and whatever, saying, like, "Oh, you're an inspiration or whatever." But I tell you, one that actually really touched me the other day was. Um, a a young lad in um a young lad in school a young white boy as well in um they were learning about black history month and they were um as a class they were told to pick a pick a like a, not an idol but a, a a black history person to someone to look up to someone you're doing well and he picked me and his dad wrote to me to tell me about it and it was one of the like most touching things i'd ever read i was like i was really like oh i'm actually like little because you doubted yeah, your yeah, yeah. Yeah. identity yeah yeah it was such a weird what a roundabout such a weird full, full circle, circle moment, like yeah. for just some little kid who enjoyed like and his dad was like he's watched your fights he loves you he's great he loves football as well and obviously you come to the club and you support the club and blah 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 and his dad explained it like um That's nice. He was like, yeah, I, the other kids were picking like Lewis Hamilton, Obama, and like these massive people. And he was like, my son picked you. And I was like, oh, a little bit of me went, oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that one. Oh, that one's yeah. in the heart. Yeah. Oh, that one. Well, oh. well, I mean, on that note, Fabio, um, coming from where you've come from, you've said, you know, knocking around with some, some lads that are doing bits and bobs and get, you know, all of that. That, that old conversation would you believe that a sport like boxing is a good idea for somebody that could be struggling like you were struggling with any you know you're talking about identity um but if they're sort of struggling with lack of direction um or if they're getting into trouble do you think boxing could give them all the tools they need for their life. One thousand percent. I think I'm. I think I'm. I'm proof and evidence of that because, like you say, there was there was. I had identity struggles, and, and I, I I found. I found a family in the gym. People of who looked like me, who didn't look like me, but we I, we all had a common goal and we felt on the same page together. 
and again direction was a massive thing for me because again when my mates were off doing whatever and going here there and everywhere I was a quite a party boy as well like I was drinking a lot and going out every weekend and doing a bit of this and a bit of that and other bits I shouldn't have been and then slowly as more and more I fell in love with boxing and I did it I, I went now nah, boys I'm not coming out tonight I'm I want to train in the morning and mm. now nah, I'm not I can't do this because I've got a fight in a week and I, I, like, I don't drink I can't oh, I can't have a drink because I'm training I'm in training camp and things like that and it slowly you don't notice it but in increments you decide for yourself to pull yourself away from it where it's a very difficult thing because I know in situations where kids struggle with things like that if someone tells you not to do something it's it, 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 not you know I'm saying it doesn't work yeah. but you need to have your own thing to go I don't want to do I, I don't want to do it I want to do this thing over here and to do that and to be better at this thing I have to give up a few things over here but it only ever works when you find that for yourself. And that, doesn't that touch on again another thing that's a really recurring theme in this and about parenting and guidance and showing, giving your kids options or giving anybody options or even government providing young kids options, those who are unlucky, not lucky enough to have parents. Give If they had options or if they were put in scenarios where like in boxing gyms or in sport or in all of these different things, that will allow... A, a, an epiphany like that for a young person to to realize themselves like you said i think it's so important that you said that because it really is being in a position where you decide for yourself mm. you want better and it's being able to navigate these young kids into that position whether it through parenting or through you know i think other, fabio other, ticks other a hell of a lot of boxes in regards to his story and how he says that and now mm. he comes to the point at where he's at now because a lot of people are expecting that when i hand out I've mm. not got that. Now that's over there and that's over there. Sometimes you've got to make your own look. You've mm. got to make your yeah. own decisions. You have to go and take it. responsibility for 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 the good and the bad you've taken in your life. And you're, you, again, you tick every one of those boxes mm. uh, in regards to that drive and ambition. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Well, look, Fabio, um, from here on, a uh, British champion, mm -hmm. cannot wait. <laughs> that little giggle he's talking about. <laughs> that's me. It's just trying to hear it. What was that, British champ? Me? Oh, great. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank well, you. Listen, thank mate, you. Thank um, absolutely buzzing to see you back in the ring again. Like I said, that last fight was amazing. Um, you literally blew the roof off the place. And, uh, thank you, mate. Yeah, I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, yeah, and thanks so much for coming on, mate. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you for having me. Great time. It makes me chuckle he's not walking around with a Lonsdale belt over his shoulder. Yeah. Should, I should have brought it. Should have brought <laughs> See, it. See, he is humble. Yeah. That's that humble side. Look. Um, thanks again for everybody um, for listening to Fighting on the Inside. Um, and we will see you guys next week. <laughs>